So let's go over lab three with uh, today. This is our lab over tissues and over skin. Now we won't spend a whole lot of time on the integumentary system today, but it is officially our skin lab. And we haven't quite gotten to that in lecture, so I'll barely introduce it, and then we'll come back and look at skin a little bit more carefully in lab when we get to it in lecture. But let's start off thinking about tissues. Now, this continuum, this should be very straightforward for you now. You know that we have spent, um, in lecture, we're doing the same continuum. In lab, we're doing this continuum. So we discussed the chemistry, if you will, of atoms and molecules. And we spent some time, you know, talking about pH. That's really at the atomic level, right, at the atoms and the electron level. And then um, last week, we looked at cells undergoing mitosis. So we saw cells, and we know that the, the, we saw the nucleus in those uh, images. And so now we're spending our time at the tissue level. We're doing histology today, and we're going to spend some time looking at epithelial tissues and connective tissues. In fact, before we leave today, you will have looked at 12 different tissues and figured out which one is which and where in the body each is found. We'll also be looking at our very first organ today, that is skin, as part of the integumentary system. From this point on, we'll be in the organ and organ system levels. So next week is the skeletal system, and we'll learn the majority of the bones in the body. And then the following week, it's the muscular system, and we'll look at about 40 or so muscles in the body. Then after that, it'll be the nervous, the digestive, the endocrine, the, you know, the cardiovascular. So we'll be spending each week pretty much in a different system from this point on throughout the course. Now, you know from lecture one, uh, as we were just kind of basically introducing the hierarchy from atom to atom, you know that there are four different types of tissues. So let's go through each of these and figure out why, you know, where each will be found in the body, just some general characteristics about each, and we're going to be focusing on only two of them today, that is epithelial and connective. So first of all, epithelial tissues. Epithelial tissues are found outside of our body, right? Lining the outer layer of our body, our epidermis is epithelial. This tissue is also found lining our tubes. So lining your blood vessels, lining your gut chambers, lining, you know, the cavities of your body. It's also the kind of tissue found covering your organs. So when I discuss the visceral pericardium, the visceral pleura, or the parietal layers, those are, those are epithelial layers. So they're very, very thin, but they're definitely lining the cavity, right? The parietal layers, the wall of the cavity, as well as shrink, shrink wrapping on top of the organ. That's the, the uh, visceral layer. And then also glands are largely epithelial. So the liver is a gland. Uh, pancreas is a gland. Anything with a gland in its name, salivary gland, thyroid gland, all of those are going to be, not exclusively, but primarily epithelial in nature. So we'll look at six different epithelial tissues today. Then we have the connective tissues. Now, this is a really broad group of tissues, and we'll also look at six of these today. This is going to be everything from tendons and ligaments, bone, cartilage, blood, and the one that's not written on here is fat or adipose. But that is also a connective tissue. Okay, fat or adipose, you can add it to that list. I know it's really small, but we'll be looking at each of these today. Now, we're not going to look today at nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is specialized in that it can conduct electrical signals very, very quickly, and we'll wait to look at that tissue when we get to lab six in the nervous system. And we're also not looking at muscular tissue today. Uh, that is specialized tissue that can move, that can change shape, that can contract. And we'll take a look at that tissue in lab five in a couple of weeks. Now, it turns out there are three different kinds of muscle, and we will look at all three. There's skeletal muscle that moves your skeleton. There is cardiac muscle found only in the heart, and there's also a type called smooth or visceral muscle that is lining your gut organs and your viscera, your blood vessels. So we'll look at each of those later on, and by the time we get to the first lab exam, we'll have 15 different tissues, okay, 12 today, and then we'll also look at these three muscle tissues uh, before the first lab exam happens. So by the time we get to lab exam, you will have in your back pocket 15 different tissues. You'll know what they look like. 
You'll be able to identify them one from another. You'll know some of their special characteristics, and you'll know where in the body you would go to find that specific kind of tissue. That's where we're heading with this whole histology. You'll also have some histology in lecture, so I'll review this briefly, not a lot, but I will review this also in lecture. Now, what makes histology a little bit, I think, frustrating for some students initially is number one, we're using the microscope, and some of you feel more comfortable than others using this microscope. Uh, number two, you probably haven't looked at these tissues before, and so this is all brand new. And the angle is going to make a big difference, the angle that the tissue was cut. So we're going to, we, we've got these slides for you, and the manufacturer who prepared these slides just took random slices through kidney, through liver, through skin. They're not uniform in any way. And sometimes the angle of the blade that you, was used to slice the tissue can vastly change how it appears to you under the microscope. So for example, if I had uh, some bone and I had a blood vessel and I cut it longitudinally, okay, as this plane is showing, I would get, you know, I would get something that looks like a bone, but Man, the blood vessel, just having two lines, I, I'm not going to be very well trained to see that, am I? Any kind of tube-like thing is going to look very different. Whereas if I'm cutting in cross-section or transversely, then I would get a nice round structure, a nice round blood vessel, and that makes sense to me. And if I cut more at an oblique angle, then I would have something that was stretched out and more ovoid. So just keep in mind that it's going to change um, what you see based upon just randomness. So your job and my job will help you find examples within your tissue where you can see it more clearly. Now you know from your pre-lab, we'll start with epithelial tissues, you know from your pre-lab that epithelial tissues are named or classified or described, those are all the same thing. If I said to you, name this epithelium, describe this epithelium, um, then you're always going to be using two words to describe or name any epithelium. One's going to deal with the shape of the cells, and one part of the name is going to deal with the layers within that tissue. So we'll start off with shape. There are three basic shapes of the cells found within epithelial tissues. They are as follows. There is squamous. You hear squamous as well. And squamous, I think squishy squashy, right? Flattened. These are the flattened cells. Then there are cuboidal cells. Cuboidal, now in two dimensions, they look square. Right, but keep in mind, cells are three-dimensional beasts, and so we're really looking at something more cuboid in its shape. And then if the cells are taller than they are wide, more rectangles in two dimension, then those are considered columnar. Okay, so we'll look at the cell shape, squamous, cuboidal, or columnar. The other thing you're going to be looking at are the layers. So here is a simple epithelium. Simple means there's just one layer of cells, just one layer. So let me give you a, a little bit of help here getting orientation. So this is your one layer of cells. The little purple dude is the nucleus. And what we see is that the epithelial layer is sitting on top of this brown layer. This brown layer is referred to as the basement membrane. And I'll refer to this a lot. So the basement membrane. Now, another thing that will always be true, and I'll go ahead and say it now, is that underneath the basement membrane, there will always be connective tissue. So the epithelial tissue will always sit on the basement membrane, and underneath the basement membrane, there will always be connective tissue. So here there's one layer of cells, so we're going to call this a simple epithelium, whereas over here, again, let's, let me give you your bearings, here's your basement membrane, and now I see multiple layers of cells. So this is going to be called stratified, two or more layers. Okay, it could be 50, it could be 100 layers, but two or more layers of cells, we're going to call it stratified. Again, we're sitting on the basement membrane, below it would be the connective tissue. Now the rule of thumb here is that you don't look at the shape, well you only look at the shape at the free surface or at the outside edge or at the top edge. And here we see that these cells at the top edge are very, very flat. So this would be more specifically a stratified squamous epithelium. We don't look at the shape down here. Ignore the shape at the basement membrane. Only look at the shape at the edge. 
and we'll only be looking at stratified squamous epithelia in this lab anyway. So you won't have any concern with this as we move through this. There's another type that's kind of a strange intermediate. It's referred to as pseudo-stratified columnar. Those two words will always go together. They'll roll off your tongue as you start saying these things. And if you look at this, I mean, it, it tells you what's going on. It says pseudo-stratified, falsely stratified. It's really a simple epithelium. If you look at it, though, at first glance, it looks like there's a row of cells up here and a row of cells down here. So it looks at first that it may be two layers, right? It might be stratified. But if you were able to look more closely, you would see that every cell is in direct connection with the basement membrane. So in fact, it's really one layer of cells that are kind of jumbled in their first appearance. We'll see this. It's very unique. It's very distinctive. And I think once you see it, you'll have no trouble identifying. Again, here is your basement membrane, and there'll be connective tissue down below that epithelial layer. These, tall, these cells are primarily, not all, but primarily very tall. So again, pseudo-stratified columnar, those terms always will flow together. Okay, so if I, we're going to start with epithelial tissues. I'll give you some characteristics. I'll go through an example of each one, and then you'll be let loose to look at those six epithelial tissues. We'll then come back together, talk about connective tissues briefly. You'll look at those six connective tissues, and that'll be our morning. So that's how the day is going to be set up for you. So let's go through, first of all, the characteristics of epithelial tissues as a generic set of rules. What is always true about epithelial tissues? Number one, they always have a free surface. That is, there's always an exposed edge. Now, that exposed edge could be to the outside environment, like your epithelium, right, the outer layer of your skin. But if we're dealing with a tube the free layer would be inside, facing the lumen, the inside of the tube. If we were dealing with the layers of your, like let's say, parietal pleura, the free surface would be facing the inside of the thoracic cavity, right? And if we were dealing with a layer, like a visceral layer, we'd be dealing with the free surface facing out from the tissue. But regardless, there's always a bound side, a side that's stuck down to the basement membrane, and there's always a side that's free to the local environment. Number two, don't have blood vessels within the epithelial tissues. Now there's a couple of exceptions we'll get to when we discuss skin, but they're rare and they're not typical or normal. So typically there are no blood vessels. Now this is a really good idea because if there were blood vessels in your epithelial layers, every time you scratch your skin, you'd bleed, right? There'd be blood vessels right there at the surface in the epidermis. Every time you ate a, something uh, like a t corn chip, and every time you were you know, swallowing that corn chip, you'd be bleeding, right? Because there's epithelial cells lining your esophagus and lining the inside of your mouth. So it's a good thing there aren't blood vessels there, right? You've got to really chomp on your tongue or burn your tongue or something to, burn, to, to bleed inside the mouth. You would also be bleeding in the, in the, um, in the anus, right? Because that's also epithelial lined. So it's a really good idea, right, that we don't have blood here. Number three, these cells are constantly dividing. Another thing about thinking about it is that they are highly mitotic. Right? They're constantly dividing. They're replacing themselves constantly. These are the most rapid growing cells in your body. This, the epithelial cells lining your gut can replenish themselves every eight hours or divide, go through the cell cycle every eight hours or so. So this is why you cut your tongue right, or burn your tongue cut the inside of your mouth, cut your skin, you know that those cells are going to readily replace themselves and that within a couple of days you'll be all back to normal. This is different for, for example, the heart, right? If the heart gets damaged, those cells don't divide. They don't readily divide and go through mitosis. The brain tissue, nervous tissue, does not readily divide and replace itself. So we can cut our skin and we know it'll replace itself. We can cut other cells and we'll see later on that those do not replace themselves. As I've already mentioned, too, it always is found on top of, superior to, right, above, whatever word you want to use there, connective tissue. So it will always be the epithelial cells sitting on the basement membrane. Below the basement membrane will always be connective tissue. That's an always, always, always true relationship between epithelial and connective tissues. They're always bordering each other. Finally, and what's not written here, is that these cells are tightly packed. By that, what I mean is that they are touching each other. 
there will be very, very, very little space between the cells. Right? They're touching each other, they're holding on to each other, tightly packed. And we'll see how that's comparative to connective tissues as we move forward through the morning. So there are six different connective tissue, or sorry, epithelial tissues that we're going to look at today. Four of them are simple, two of them are stratified. So as I go through this list, I want you to tell me now already what would you expect to see? Number one, simple squamous. Simple squamous. What would you be looking for? What would you be expecting based upon this name? Simple. One layer thick. Squamous. Those one layer of cells are going to be very flat. Okay, so one layer of flat cells versus simple cuboidal. One layer. Squares, right? Cuboidal cells. Simple columnar. We get it, right? One layer of tall columnar cells. Pseudostratified columnar. It's going to look jumbled. But what we're going to realize is that really it's just one layer of cells, even though it appears to be multiple, most of those cells will be tall. Okay. Now, over on the stratified side, we're going to see two different types, stratified squamous keratinized and stratified squamous non-keratinized. And I'll hold off on describing the difference of those two when I show them to you. So let's go through these. Yes, ma'am. Um, I feel like you're talking about the sides of the stratified layers. Floating. Yes. Always look at the top edge. Top edge yes. Layout, what shape you call it. And okay. we're only going to be looking at this semester two different stratified epithelia, and they're both squamous. Okay. So you're never going to have to distinguish that, but I wanted you to know the rule of thumb. So always look at the outside edge when describing. There are stratified cuboidal. There are stratified columnar in the body. We're not dealing with them this semester. Okay. So let's take a look first at simple squamous. Now, last week, I'm sure I told you that I am not on the lab exam going to hand you a slide and say, here, find me a good example of metaphase under 400 power magnification. Right? It'd, be, it'd be the perfect thing for me to ask you to do as a practical skill, but there won't be time or the opportunity for me to quiz you on something like that on the practical exam. Instead, the microscope will already be focused to a premium example, and you'll simply look in the microscope and report, oh, that is metaphase. right? Or, during metaphase, the chromosomes line up. Same thing will be true here. I will, today, we'll be looking and hunting and going on our hunting expedition looking for examples of this under the microscope. However, on the lab exam, I will either show you a PowerPoint image pointing to a primo example, or, and that's how we'll do the quiz next week, or you'll have a microscope already preset to, a, to an example, and at the pointer, it'll say what kind of tissue is at the pointer. So you'll have to be able to recognize these. Okay, today you're looking and recognizing. You'll be assessed, though, by recognition. So let's start here with simple squamous. Now, again, I told you I always give you arrows. So what you're looking at here, you've got two arrows, and what you're focusing on is just this layer of cells between those two arrows. If you look at them, these cells are kind of, you know, kind of, if you look at them, they're kind of long and, and thin. So that would be a single layer, flat cells. That's simple squamous between the arrows. This actually is found in the lungs, but I want to be even more specific than that. It's found in the alveoli. Now, the alveoli are the little air sacs in your lungs. You got like 300 million of these little air sacs in your lungs, and each of those air sacs is surrounded by this type of very, very thin tissue. It's because it's so thin that oxygen, right? Oxygen can move in and out. Oxygen, O2, can move in and out of these tissues very, very easily. The other place we find this kind of tissue is mesothelium. Now, that's a fancy word for your serous membranes. So when I say visceral pericardium, parietal pericardium, your pleura, your peritoneum, they too are made up of simple squamous epithelia. I know when I think about them, especially in lab one, oh, I think these are big layers, right? They're something that's shrink-wrapped to the surface of my heart, something that's lining my thoracic cavity. These must be very thick layers, but these serous membranes are very, very thin. They're a simple squamous, very, very thin. Um, you hear about mesothelioma, right? You, we can't turn on the TV without hearing about some lawyer chasing after patients with mesothelioma. It's a special kind of cancer that usually 
attacks the mesothelium of the lung. It, it affects the pleura, right? And it, it's not very common unless you've been exposed to asbestos or black dust. So it affects the uh, pleura. It can also, though, affect the peritoneum. It can also affect the pericardium, but it's more often in the lungs when you hear about mesothelioma. Now, you're not going to see this view. On our slides that we have for you, you're going to see this view. And what you're doing is basically looking down on a flat sheet, right? Imagine that we took a flat sheet of these simple squamous cells and laid them flat on the, on the, cell, on the microscope slide. So what you're going to see is going to look more like, I look at it as sort of being, like being cobblestones, right? This kind of arrangement of cells, a very flattened sheet of cells, tightly packed to each other, touching each other. It's not easy to appreciate that it's one uh, cell thick, but I assure you that it is, but it's very, very thin. But when you see this tissue, this is the view you're going to see. All right, so I'm just telling you now, when you see the slide, when I quiz you on this, this is what you're going to see. One layer thick, very flat, but you're gonna see it as this cobblestone appearance. So as we go through this, you wanna be asking yourself, okay, where is it found? Keep this kind of stuff in, in mind. Number two, simple cuboidal. Let me give you your bearings here. This is your basement membrane. Okay, it's that circular arrangement. It's found in a few places in the body, but the primo example that I'll be sharing with you most of the time will be from the kidney. Okay. Yes, it's found in the thyroid. Yes, it's found in the liver, but most of our slides are from the kidney. And the kidney, as you know, filters your blood, and that filtering process involves a lot of tubes. So what you're basically seeing here is a tube going in and out of the board, and it is lined by a nice single layer of cells, right? You see the single layer of cells going around in a circular arrangement. This is the lumen of the cell. That's the, the tube of the cell. And so the center is where the free surface would be. And these cells are also bound down to this basement membrane. Now, this is a tube. You can see over here, there's a little bit more of a tube showing in this view. There's a tube over here. There are tubes everywhere. Here, we're seeing a nice view of a tube, though, in and out. Simple squamous kidney. Okay? Sorry. Simple cuboidal. Take it back. Simple cuboidal kidney. Circular arrangement. Keep that in your head. Simple columnar. Okay, let me start off by giving you your bearings. So the basement membrane for this particular tissue is right here. Okay, now, yes, there's a basement membrane right here as well. But this is what I want to focusing on is up here. Is that adipose in between? It is not. That is, well, it could be a little bit, but it's connective tissue of some sort. Okay? And so what you're seeing is that this is the basement membrane, right, right along here. And below it, we'd find connective tissue. Now, fat is a connective tissue, so there could be a little bit of fat in there, but we won't go there quite yet. So what you're seeing is a single layer of cells. Look at them. Tall columnar cells, right? Very, very tall cells. One layer thick, sitting on the basement membrane. Here's your free surface up here, and this is found in your intestinal tract. So this is like your small intestine, and your food would be traveling through this. This would be your lumen. So that's the lumen where the food would be traveling through the small intestine. Now, what's the job of your small intestine? Primary job? Absorption, right? So the stomach broke it down chemically, churned it up, and now those, those nutrients are traveling through the small intestine, and they're going to get absorbed, right, from the tube, and they're going to be brought through the cells. So this is a simple columnar layer. Do you see that right along this edge, it looks like there's like a, a double layer. It looks like there's a pink, dark layer in there. At the surface of this tissue, although you cannot see them individually, I mentioned in Chapter 3, the organelle chapter, that microvilli are too small to be seen under the light microscope. But microvilli have this kind of fuzzy-looking appearance. So lining this tissue would also be microvilli. Now, why are they there? They're there to increase the surface area. We just talked about surface area last week. The greater the surface area, the more molecules the gut can absorb. So as the food is traveling through the intestines, it has these microvilli on the surface of the cells 
that increases the surface area, now more absorption can occur into, this, into the body. There's also going to be goblet cells in this tissue. I'll describe goblet cells even better in the next slide. Um, as I look at this, this cell right there is a goblet cell. Here's a goblet cell right here as well. They're not as easy to see here, but I want you to know that they're there, and goblet cells produce mucus. So you want your small intestine to certainly be nice and moist. You don't want a dry, desiccated gut. So we want to keep this food traveling along the intestine so there's some mucus being produced that will help with motility and keeping things nice and oiled. So that's simple columnar found in the small intestine, has with it microvilli and goblet cells. Okay, so you see where I'm kind of, I need you to keep these ideas clumped together. As you see this, identify it, and then think, okay, form and function always go together. So it's a simple epithelium. It's tall cells. There's absorption going on. I'm in the intestine. There are microvilli there. Keep all these together. Now, let's take a look at the pseudostratified. I'm going to show you the basement membrane. It is right here. So there's the basement membrane. Below it would be connective tissue. Above it, right, we've got this jumbled layer of cells. Do you agree kind of a jumbled layer of cells in here? This is pseudostratified. Most of the cells are taller, so it's going to be pseudostratified columnar. If you look along the edge of this, cell, of this tissue, you do see, you can make out individual little structures. So this, or these are cilia. Now cilia are much longer than microvilli, and they are visible under light microscopy. This pseudostratified columnar epithelium is found in your respiratory tract, specifically your trachea, your windpipe. It's also found lining your nasal passages. There's also much more obvious goblet cells here. So every place I see these big white billowing sort of marshmallow looking things, those are goblet cells. Again, they're producing mucus. And this is found, again, along your respiratory tract. So what do you think the purpose is of the mucus and of the cilia in the respiratory tract? Why do we need to have these things there? Catch things, right? So as you're breathing in particulates, bacteria, sm small particles, whatever it is, as you're breathing stuff in, those small molecules get stuck, right, to the mucus, sticky mucus, and then that mucus is being pushed up by the cilia. So the cilia are kind of waving like wheatgrass in Kansas, right, kind of moving across the field, and they're sweeping this junk up and out of your windpipe and out of your nasal passages. Uh, what happens in smokers is that they lose the cilia, and this tissue gets pissed off about all the smoke and eventually gives up. And so now smokers no longer have this protection. They don't have the cilia. And so now those smoke particles can get to the lung more easily and set up cancer 20 years later. So uh, that's sort of what's going on with the smoker. Now, if you look at the cartoon, you will notice... I like the cartoon because it really gives you an idea of what is a goblet cell. They've really, tr well, it's too thick. But they have outlined this goblet cell in the cartoon, right? So it's like a little goblet of mucus. That's where they get their name, these little goblet cells producing mucus. So those are the four simple epithelia we'll be looking at today. The last two are stratified. And again, as I've been doing, let me show you the basement membrane here. But here the basement membrane is squiggly. Okay, it's that squiggly line. Again, connective tissue down below it. These ridges, these up and down peaks and valleys are what give you your individual fingerprint. So each of us, you know, has a different series of peaks and valleys that hold our epidermis, uh, our outer layer of skin onto our body. So that's the basis of your fingerprints. And what we're seeing is many, many layers of cells going up to the top. At the very, very surface, these cells are definitely very, very flaky, very flat. So this is stratified squamous. 
What you notice, though, is about halfway up, you see a very distinct change happen in this tissue. And below this dotted line, the cells are alive. The cells are dividing. They're very mitotic. They're, they're very metabolic. They're doing their thing. And as they move toward the surface, though, you see a dramatic change happen. And then they start to die. And as they begin to die, you see that they lose their nucleus. So if you look really carefully, you'll see that these cells have this dark staining nucleus all the way up. And we'll talk about the names of these layers later in lecture, not for now. But at about halfway up, you notice that the cells no longer have a nucleus. These cells are very, very flat, very, very dry, very, very flaky. And this is what most of the dust in your house is. So most of the dust in the house is you, right? It's you flaking off into the atmosphere and line, landing on your, on your um, surfaces. You'll also notice, oops, sorry, that up here there are no nuclei. So there's no evidence of life in these cells. They are dead, flaky, dry layers at the surface. One of the things that these proteins, or sorry, that these uh, cells do, though, is pr create a protein called keratin. So we say this is a keratinized tissue. Keratinized means that this is dead, right? This is dead tissue at the surface. It's flaking off. Now compare that, and this is found in your epidermis. So this is your outer layer of your skin, head to toe, everywhere in your body, you've got epidermis. Compare that with what's over here. Now this one over here is not the same. This is non-keratinized on the right. I want to show it to you side by side so you can see the difference. Again, giving you your bearings, here's your basement membrane, connective tissue down below, many, many layers of cells, but at the surface they're flat, right? So it's stratified squamous. But what do you see up here at the surface that you don't see on the left? See the little dots, right? Those are the nuclei. So these cells are still alive, they did not die, and they did not fill up with keratin. So this is non-keratinized, stratified squamous. That's a mouthful, but those words will have to go together when you're naming this. So whenever you're describing a stratified squamous, there's two flavors, keratinized or non-keratinized, and you need to mention which one you're looking at. Now, the non-keratinized, I have a slide coming up, the last slide for now. This non-keratinized is what's going to be found lining your oral cavity, right, found in your, lining your mouth going down the esophagus, also the anus and the vagina. Those are all places where you would have stratified, squamous, non-keratinized. They're all internal. They're all at the entrances to the body. These are places where there has to be protection, stratified layers, but the cells are not dry at the surface. They're moist at the surface. Take a look at this picture on the right. This is your tongue. So again, connective tissue down below, the basement membrane, and you can see that there are nuclei at the surface. Over here, here's your basement membrane, connective tissue down below, many, many layers, but at the surface you see nuclei. Okay, so again, oral cavity, esophagus, anus, uh, vagina would be examples of where stratified, squamous, non-keratinized is found. So, your job, right? If you look up for the quiz for next week, it says, number one, recognize the six epithelial tissues, and we'll get to six connective tissues in a few minutes. When you're thinking about these, not only do you have to recognize them, but know their special characteristics. So as I mentioned in the slides, are there microvilli, or are there goblet cells, are there cilia associated with these different cells, or tissues? Uh, thirdly, where in the body would you find it? So have a good example of where you would find it in the body. And then... We'll go through the other ones. And number four up there, that's pretty easy. Know the four primary tissue types, right? Epithelial, connective, muscle, nervous. So those are the four primary types of tissues. And you can write down that list for next week's review for the quiz. Um, I'm a little bit confused. Sure. So for the practical, would we be looking at these two or are we only looking at the top view? Or is that no, that was the, the top view was only for that very first one, simple squamous. All the other ones, you're going to see them as they showed up on the slides. Okay? And you'll be, you're going to see the same slides today as you open up your slides and take a look at them. The tissue slides you have here are the same ones I'll be asking you about on the exam. Okay? So you're, I'm not going to pull out some special set of slides that look differently than what you're seeing here. 
Now, if you would, turn in your big Ammerman book to pages 94 to 96, and there you'll find some big circles. These pages are for you to record what you're about to see. The previous pages to this are some beautiful micrographs, some examples of these tissues. I'll show you later on where to go online. There's a beautiful histology atlas in mastering, actually over on PAL 3.0, the practice anatomy lab, and I'll show you how to get to that. You can always go to Dr. Google. He's on faculty here. And uh, you can type in simple squamous epithelium and be overwhelmed by images. And uh, you can also go to other places online. And I'll show you some of those things in a few minutes. So on 94 through 96, there are a couple things you're going to cross off. We are not going to be looking today at stratified cuboidal. So number six, you can cross off. And on the next page, we're not looking at transitional. You can cross off number seven. That leaves you now six circles, right? Six different tissues that you'll be looking at. At your table, you'll find a folder. In that folder, you should find a laminated page, sort of a, just a directory of what's in here. These represent the tissues that you're responsible for for this first half of the semester. Number one is mitosis. You're not looking at that today. We did that one last week. Two, three, four, five, six, and seven. The next six are the six epithelial tissues. The number does not correspond to the number in the book. I apologize. These are just numerical for our inventory. But you'll find the six different epithelial tissues here. And then we'll look at those. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll talk about connectives. And then the next six slides are the six connective tissues you're going to need. The last ones are muscle that we'll look at later in the, in, the, in the semester. So make sure when you're done with these that you put them back in their correct order. It doesn't matter which order you look at them, just those six at first. If you great, get a fine example, I'm okay with your sharing with your neighbor. Uh, you know, a great example of this. Now you do have, uh, what, well, I should say one of my pet peeves, right, is someone raising their hand saying, I don't see what I'm supposed to be looking for and they haven't yet looked in their book. So make sure you're looking on those pages in the, you know, the early 90s in your Ammerman book. It gives you examples of what these tissues look like. You definitely want to know what you're looking for before you go on the search, right? It makes it a whole lot easier. Keep in mind, these are epithelial tissues. And where are they found? On the outside surface of the body or lining inside tubes. So when you're looking at your slice of tissue, you're likely going to have to go to the outside edge. If you're looking at, you know, if you're looking at the skin, you're going to have to go inside a tube, look at a high magnification if you are looking at, for example, uh, simple cuboidal. I'll help you with that. That's why I'm here. So uh, grab your microscopes and uh, make sure they were put away properly and make sure that you think about how you're going to put it away yourself. And I'll be here to answer any questions. We'll do this for probably a good 30, 40 minutes or so. And um, you're going to be using your colored pencils to write down what you see. And underneath each circle, you'll see a letter A and a letter B. The letter A, is, it tells you, is for you to record what you see, something that will remind you of what you're seeing. And the B blank underneath each is for you to tell you, uh, report where in the body this particular type of tissue is found. So use those two A and B blanks to help yourself get organized this morning. So looking at these tissues, so simple squamous. Tell me what you saw. Tell me any other special things about it, and tell me where you would find it. Okay, so simple squamous. Where do we find it? Simple squamous. One layer, flat cells. Where in the lung, very specifically? The alveoli, right? The little air sacs. The little air sacs within the lungs. Also, simple squamous on the, the serous membranes, right? The visceral and parietal layers would also be considered simple squamous. So if I asked you, where would you find it, right? I need to hear one of those places. Number two, simple cuboidal. Now, where do we find it? Kidney. In the arrangements we saw, typically in a circular arrangement, right? And it's a one layer of cells. And what's happening in the kidney? The kidneys are filtering, right? So in the alveoli, what's going on? We've got gas exchange, right? And the kidney, we've got <coughs> filtering of blood. And then what's going on in the simple columnar of the gut? 
absorption of nutrients. So what you're seeing is that any place where there's one layer of cells, regardless of their shape, there's exchange, filtration, movement of molecules across that one layer of cells. Form and function, right, always go together. This idea of anatomy and physiology always are going to come together for us. So that simple columnar, what, tell me more about it. We found it in the small intestine. What else was associated with this? What else do you see on this simple columnar from the small intestine? It's a single row cell. It is? It's narrow cells. Good. Goblet cells, keeping it moist, good. And also the presence of? Microvilli, right, to increase the surface area, to increase the absorption. Then there's pseudostratified, jumbled looking bunch of cells. Where do we find it? Yeah, the trachea and the nasal passages. And what was unique about this tissue? Or what, what were some special things about this tissue? You can see the cilia, right? There are definitely cilia. And also there would be lots of, just like the last one, there'd be a lot of goblet cells. By keeping this area moist and sticky. What about stratified squamous keratinized? Where do we find it? This is the epidermis, right? This is the outer layer of the skin from head to toe everywhere. It's the only place you find this stuff, right? It's only on the outside. And um, stratified, many, many layers. It fills up with this protein called keratin, uh, which is a waterproofing protein. It keeps your skin waterproof. It's the same protein that also makes up your fingernails and your hair. So this keratin stuff is all over the place on the outside of your body. And then stratified squamous non-keratinized. What was different about it? All the cells are living. Yeah, at the surface, right, you're still going to see nuclei. So the cells are still living and moist at the surface. They're not dead and flaky like your skin. And because they haven't died, they didn't fill up with keratin. So we say this is non-keratinized. And we find this oral cavity, esophagus, anus, and vagina as four good examples. OK, so those are your six different epithelial tissues. What do you think? If you saw them again, would you be OK? Now, where are you going to go to see them again? Let me give you a quick infomercial on where you will be able to go to practice this. Because it really, this takes practice, just like anything else. So I'm going to encourage you to go to, go into mastering. <coughs> and once you are in mastering, then you will go over to the study area. So let's go into mastering. Now, in mastering right now, you're going to see your chapter three homework. Uh, maybe open, let's see. Oh, wants me to sign in. Okay, sure. Okay, so once you're in mastering, go down to study area, and this is how you got to those AMP flicks a while back. So go down to study area, and once you are in study area, this is the Martini textbook website, if you will. <coughs> Come down here to PAL. Under lab, it says PAL 3.0. Under PAL, this is that anatomy cadaver program. So you've got the cadaver images, you've got the anatomical models, We'll start interacting with this a lot starting next week. Okay, the bones and muscles, this will become a really important place to go. But for now, we're going to go over to the third tab, and this is histology. Click on histology and click on epithelial tissues, and you'll have a bunch of different images that you can choose from. Some we've seen, some we have not. But oh, look, this is that cobblestone look, right? This is that simple squamous. If you click on show labels, it will show you where the nuclei are of the cells. It'll tell you what it is. And you can flip through some of these different images and see. Now, this is the kidney. And I know you're looking for that circular arrangement, but you know that based upon the slicing, right, the angle, you may be seeing that tube opened up longitudinally. So here you're still seeing that single layer of cuboidal cells, 
but the tube is running from left to right rather than in and out of the board. So this is a great place to go. You can also do yourself some quizzing on here as well. What is this one? These tall cells are the, not, no, not pseudostratified. This is the lining of your small intestine. Now, I know it looks kind of like it's wavy, but your, your intestines are very, very wavy. A lot of surface area. So this would be a layer of simple columnar, right, on top of each other. OK, but look at this and practice with this. You can also go to, just go to Google, right? Just go to Google and type in, come on, just go to Google, type in simple squamous epithelium, and, or whatever it is you want to look at. Hopefully your computer at home is faster than this one. And if you just type in simple squamous epithelium into Google, you'll be overwhelmed by images. Oh, this is crazy. It doesn't want to let me out. Here we go. So you just go simple squamous. And then you will go to images, and you'll be overwhelmed by all the different variations you'll see. So for example, I'm only going to show you slides like you've seen here, but this is the cartoon representation of that simple squamous. Here is a different colored staining, but you see it's the same thing, right? Over here, again, the cobblestone appearance. So as you look around, you'll start seeing this. Click on any of these, and it will tell you a little bit more about it and give you some more information. So I encourage you, don't just leave now and come back next week and try to do this. Next week's quiz will be PowerPoint. Okay, so it won't be microscope set up around the room, but it will be PowerPoint images on the screen. Name that tissue. Where is it found? Okay, special things that we've talked about specifically in the PowerPoints. Okay, so those are the epithelial tissues. Anything in there that I need to clarify now that I've gone through that with you? Anything at all? Okay, let's head now down to connective tissues. And I think you will find that this goes easier. Uh, that these six different connective tissues are very distinct, very easy to identify one from another. And today we're going to be looking at blood, adipose or fat, cartilage, bone, and two types of connective tissue referred to as loose or loose areolar, another called dense regular. So, boy, this is a really broad group of tissues. You've got blood and bone, and you might be thinking, why, why is it that scientists have clumped these tissues together, and what is it about blood and bone that make them part of the same family of tissues? So let me tell you what it is that connects all of these, no pun intended. So we've got loosely packed cells. Okay, so that's one of the distinctions. All connective tissues are made of loosely packed cells. That is, the cells are not touching each other necessarily. Think about blood, right? You got red cells and white cells bumping around each other, and everything else we'll see, the cells are not touching each other necessarily. That's a nice distinction between connectives and epithelial. Remember, epithelial tissues were tightly packed, so they're all touching each other. Here, they're loosely associated, loosely packed cells. Now, what's outside of those cells is stuff referred to as ground substance. Now, it's a funny word, I know, but this is non-living stuff. And I'm just going to put the word stuff, right? It's the stuff outside of the cells. That stuff is going to include proteins. And there's three basic types of proteins that you're going to see in these connective tissues. You're going to see collagen, elastin, and what's sometimes referred to as reticular. So you hear about collagen fibers, elastin fibers, reticular fibers. In this case, that word fiber means protein. Now, whenever you hear about a tissue having collagen, I want you to think in strength. So this is a tremendous strength-providing protein. Tissues that have a lot of collagen are very, very strong, like bones and tendons. If you hear about a tissue having a lot of elastin, it kind of suggests 
that it has a lot of elasticity, right? A lot of stretch. Your ear, your nose has a lot of elastic tissue. And then finally, reticular. Now, the word reticular means network. Where have you heard that word reticulum before? Reticular. Endoplasmic reticulum. What is it? A network, a series of membranes, plasma membranes, inside within the cell. Endoplasmic reticulum. A network of membranes within. Reticulated giraffe. Right? A reticulated giraffe has that pattern, looks like a scaffolding. Um, the retina is a network of photoreceptors in the eye. So you'll see this word reta, reti, retinum, uh, ret all these terms all mean a network of something. Now what these proteins do, these reticular fibers, therefore they form, you could put down network or a scaffolding. Right? They're creating an area on which other things are built. Okay, so a scaffolding, a building, and reticular fibers are sort of found everywhere. They're sort of the basic building blocks of all things within the body. Okay, so uh, when it comes down to functions of connective tissue, this is really broad, but think about those six connective tissues. Tell me some functions of blood, bone, tendon. What are some functions? Bone and cartilage are all about Strength, structure, protection. Fat is all about... It's protecting. It's protecting. I've got a lot of it. I'm, I'm well protected. It's also, though, storing energy. Um, blood, when you think about blood, what's it doing? It's like fighting bacteria and stuff. There's immune, there's immune response in your blood, but there's also transportation, right? I, my point is there's a lot of different functions, and I think they're pretty straightforward. But lots of different things that these tissues are doing for you in your body. So let's go through each of these again, like I did before. Let's take a look at a couple of the individual characteristics of these tissues. And this is what you'll be looking for as you take a look at these today. So the first one is blood. Now you will not be seeing blood this magnified. This is highly magnified, but what you're seeing, each of these spheres would be a red blood cell. Okay, so that's a red blood cell. This larger, Cell is a white blood cell. We'll learn some of their specific names later in the course, but for now we'll just call them white cells and red cells. This little blip over here would likely be a platelet, and platelets are involved in your blood clotting. And we'll talk a lot about blood in chapter 17 or so. Now, so we've got loosely packed cells, right? Cells are not necessarily touching each other. And what would this space between the cells be? That's the ground substance, right? The stuff outside of the cells. But in blood, that ground substance has a special name, and that is plasma. So this is the liquidy portion of your blood. This is the liquid ground substance. And in that ground substance, I assure you, there are proteins. We don't think about them until we cut ourselves, and then we're really glad that our blood can clot, right? So there are proteins in this stuff, in the plasma, around loosely packed cells, so we see now why blood is considered a connective tissue. It, it has those three characteristics, right? Loosely packed cells surrounded by stuff, the ground substance, in which there are protein fibers found. Number two. I should say, too, um, blood, when you're looking at blood, when you're looking at blood today, you're going to see this big blood smear, and in order to see it well, you're going to want to go to the edge of your sample. You don't want to go where it's densely packed cells, where all the cells are all over the place. You won't see much. It'll just be a big black or red blob. So go over to the edge, and there you'll see the individual cells a little bit more easily. The second tissue, adipose. Okay, fat or adipose. Now, I need you to get a visual, a sort of a, uh, an idea, something in your head to help you remember these things. So when you see this, what comes to mind? What other things look sort of like this? Say it again. Are you thinking like... In everyday life, what does this kind of look like or remind you of? Marshmallows. Marshmallows, I like it. Anything else? No. <laughs> Cotton balls, marshmallows, corn puffs. 
but I like marshmallows because if you eat enough marshmallows, it'll make you fat, right? So marshmallows and fat kind of make you think together things. So what you're seeing here, the cells here are called adipocytes. What you're going to see is I'm going to be naming the different cells in these tissues as we go through these. So before we had white, red, white blood cells and red blood cells in blood. Here we're going to have adipocytes, or adipocytes, you'll hear it pronounced both ways. So these are the cells of fat, adipocytes. Now each of these big spaces, that line that I'm tracing, that is the cell membrane for the adipocyte. And the nucleus has been shoved over to the side. So you'll see some of these darker stained areas. That's actually the nucleus for the cell. Now in your body, these cells will be filled with fat. All right, they're storage cells. But what happens is that when these tissues are being prepared for the microscope slide, one of the steps, there's a non-polar solvent. There's an acetone-like molecule which is used to prepare this, and the fat gets dissolved. So all you're going to see are these big, empty spaces. Okay, so when you see these big, marshmallowy, empty spaces, you're thinking adipose. So nothing doesn't look like blood, right? And it doesn't look like anything epithelial. So you'll start to make these differences in your head as you look at this. Next, this is cartilage. Now, I want you to ignore what's over here on the far right-hand side. That is muscle over here. But everything else to the left of this is cartilage. Now, what do you see? I don't see marshmallows. So what do I see now? Fish eggs, that's fine. Little eggs. Anybody see anything else? My, my, my little simple mind, I see eyeballs. See the eyeball? Right? And what kind of eyeballs? Could be any kind of eyeball. But I think, oh, that's my cat's eye. And the only reason I say that is because cat and cartilage are close enough for my simple mind to remember. So these are little cat eyeballs. Right? So I see little eyeballs looking at me. Now, some of them look a little double, little weird, right? Some of them are in pairs, and that's okay. But you see little eyeballs, right? And this is, what you're seeing is the nucleus and the cell, and these cells are called chondrocytes. So the cells that make up cartilage are called chondrocytes, cells of cartilage. And there are three different kinds of cartilage, but we're going to be looking only at hyaline cartilage. We, there is fibrocartilage in the body. There is elastic cartilage in the body. We won't be looking at it specifically. You may hear me mention it along the way later in the course, but for now we're just going to be looking at hyaline cartilage. So what we're looking at here is loosely packed cells, and all this stuff outside of the cells is what? Ground substance, right? The stuff outside of the cells. And it turns out that that stuff's going to include some proteins. Okay, some, pro some collagen, some elastin, some reticular fibers. And um, another thing I want you to know about cartilage is that it's avascular. Which means what? It has no blood. Right? Avascular tissues, there's no blood going through cartilage. That's similar to epithelial, isn't it? Remember we said there are no blood vessels going through epithelial tissues? Likewise, there's no blood going through cartilage. It's not true of all connected tissues, but it is true of cartilage. Now, the word hyaline means glassy. It's not a word we see very much. But this is the most abundant type of cartilage in your body. This is the type of cartilage that your skeleton was once before it became bone. So in a, in a fetus of two to three months old, the skeleton is mostly hyaline cartilage. Did anyone go to Bodies Revealed? that exhibit that was in Grand Rapids maybe three years ago or so. And if you went to that, you may have a recollection of this. So you were in one little ex, uh, exhibit area, and there was a sign that said, warning, warning, right? Areas of high you know, controversy. And it was often the reproductive structures. And in there, there was a series of human fetuses developmentally from very young through um, pretty much through the entire fetal process. And behind it was some backlighting. And as you looked at those fetuses, you could see right through their skeleton early on in development because that early skeleton is made up not of bone, but of hyaline 
cartilage. So, you know, the early fetus is very squishy, very soft compared to later on. So we've got um, an avascular tissue with chondrocytes, and this is hyaline cartilage. The other cartilages look similar, and so I'm, but I'm going to have you deal with today hyaline cartilage. The fourth tissue, bone. Okay, bone. Now, next week is our skeletal lab. And next week, there would be an opportunity for us to pull out the microscopes and look at bone under the microscope. However, we're going to be busy learning about 190 bones in the body. So we're not going to have time next week to pull out the microscopes and look at bone. So I want to look at it now. It's, it's a connective tissue. But I want to spend a little bit more time with bone than I would on any other tissue so that next week we don't have to deal with this. Okay, so there are six things, and it says up there on the board, number five on the quiz, microanatomy of bone, six structures, six things that I want you to know when it comes to bone. So when you slice through bone, this is what you see on the board. What comes to mind? Here's the cartoon, here's the artist's rendition of a cartoon, and here is the actual image you're gonna see under the microscope. What comes to mind? What do you see? I think it looks like a tree trunk. I'm okay with tree trunk, right? Those annual rings on a tree trunk. Now, the reason that is, is that, you know, bone does grow bigger in diameter, and so there's a little bit of a similarity between bone and trees. And so that's a good, I like that. See, there's another circular arrangement here. You see more of a circular here. There's some circle going on here. So what you see is that bone is really made up of a bunch of cylinders, right? And these cylinders are going in and out of the board. And these entire cylindrical structures are called osteons. Okay, so every osteon is this entire cylindrical structure. Now, remember, it's not just a circle, right? It's a cylinder going in and out of the board. This is also called a Haversian system. So just like you need to know frontal and coronal are the same thing, recognize that Haversian system is the same as an osteon. In the very center of the osteon, there's a central canal, CC. You'll also see it referred to as the Haversian canal, just to confuse us. And traveling through that central canal are blood vessels and nerves. If you've ever cut a bone, you know it's a big, or broken a bone, you know it's a big, bloody, painful mess. Right? So it's painful, nerves, and very bloody, lots of vascular, right? Lots of blood vessels traveling through your bone. Now, you said you saw an annual ring sort of idea. So we're seeing these layers, right? Those layers within this bullseye or tree trunk. Each of those layers is called a lamella. Oops, a lamella. Where else, what other word sounds like lamella? Any other word that comes to mind? How about laminated? Something that's laminated has a thin layer, doesn't it? So layers, lamella, lamb. So we've got these layers, these lamella. And what is it we're seeing in a arrangement? What we're seeing in a circular arrangement are these black spots. And each of those black spots represents a space called a lacunae. Now, lacuna is singular. When you add the end on the when the you end the add the e on the end, sorry, that becomes plural. So one lacuna, many lacunae. And what these are are spaces, cavities, areas where the cells are hanging out. Now in bone, we don't have chondrocytes. Instead, we have osteocytes. So these are the bone cells, osteocytes. They're living in these lacunae. But man, they've got a problem. Right? Every cell in your body needs oxygen. Every cell in your body needs nutrients. Every cell in your body needs to get rid of waste products. And these cells are sort of cocooned or locked into hard bone. So these cells need to communicate one through another, and they do so through a series of what's called canaliculi. Look at the first five words, first five letters, sorry, and you see canal. Right? So these are little canals. Right, little canals, little spaces, little cracks, if you will, within the bone. And this is going to allow for nutrients and waste products and oxygen and CO2 to move back and forth between the cells. Next week, I'll introduce you to the Volkman's canals. And that should be two N's. That's a typo. But 
We won't worry about Volkman canals today. That'll, I'll show those to you next week. So what I want you to know for next week, it says know the microanatomy, another way of saying the histology, of bone, six things. What are the six things? Osteon, central canal, lamella, lacunae, in which we find the osteocytes, and they communicate through canaliculi. So those are the six things that I want you to know a little bit more about bone than any other tissue, and that'll save us some time next week. Doesn't look like corn puffs, right? Doesn't look like fat. Doesn't look like eyeballs looking back at you. It looks really quite distinct. Oh, I should go back. I like the cartoon up here. Uh, the cartoon, uh, the artist renditioning of this looks a lot like, to me, a bloodshot eyeball, right? So again, you get all these visine moments up here. So there's the central canal, right? And, and in here, you can really see those canaliculi. So the canaliculi would be these little canals, these little, little cracks, these little spaces in between the lacunae. Okay, those little bloodshot lines would be the canaliculi. Okay, moving to the last two. First one is loose. You'll also refer to it as loose areolar or areolar connective tissue. So sometimes these words are separated. Sometimes they appear separately. It's the same thing. Now, what comes to mind when you see this tissue? No eyeballs, no corn puffs, no, no tree trunks. But what comes to mind when you see this? Anything at all? I see confetti, right? Someone had a party, threw a bunch of confetti. Someone had a birthday party, or there's a streamers at the, at the parade. And I just remember that at the party, there were some loose people. It works, right? So this party stuff, right, and loose, put these two things together. So loose areolar connective tissue. Now, what you're seeing here, all these dark staining nuclei, right? Loosely packed cells, same old story. These strings are the different fibers. So some of these would be collagen. Some of these would be elastin. Some of these would be reticular fibers. You don't have to figure out which one's which. They're just all the different fibers being made. The cells here are fibroblasts. Well, you know from your vocab that blast means something germinates from it or buds from it or is built from it. And what do these cells make? Fibers, these protein fibers, right? So fibroblasts are all about making protein fibers, fibroblasts. And these fibers, like I said, would be out here in this ground substance. And some of them would be collagen, some would be reticular, some would be elastic fibers. This stuff is found everywhere. There's not just one specific place where you would find this in high density, although I will just write down, so you have a place to think about, I will write down dermis. Now, the dermis is the second layer of your skin, the deeper layer of your skin, and there's a portion of your dermis where there is some of this loose connective tissue. Other than that, it's the only location I'm going to deal with, but you'll hear it, you'll men you'll hear it mentioned in a lot of places. We've got one last, one left, and that is going to be dense, regular connective tissue. What do you see now? Bacon? Wavy? Maybe. See all the waviness in here, right? Kind of like, you see a bunch of wavy strings, if you will? Now, those strings are all collagen. Right? So, again, when I told you, when you hear the word collagen, what are you thinking about? Strength. They're still the same cells. In fact, the cells here are so squished that they look very elongated. So these dark things you're seeing are, again, fibroblasts and the nucleus of the fibroblast. And these fibroblasts are making a lot of, oops, are making a lot of collagen. And this collagen is very, very strong. So this is what your tendons and your ligaments look like under the microscope. Very, very strong. What does a tendon do? It connects a muscle to a bone. Right? Tendons connect muscles to bones. Very, very strong. Ligaments connect and support bone to bone. Right? So ligaments are bone to bone. Tendons are muscle to bone. Very, very strong. So we see a lot of collagen. 
Now this collagen is densely packed. The cells aren't densely packed, but what, is, what this dense refers to is the density of the collagen fibers. So densely packed collagen fibers, and they are arranged in a very regular way, giving strength to this tissue. I think of dense regular tissue as being like woven, I heard someone say thread or fabric, right? String. So I think of this tissue as being like my fingers. If my fingers were the collagen fibers, and I've created now a very strong fabric, right? I'm just creating my tendon. Has anyone ever torn or stretched a tendon or a ligament? Anybody at all? Or knows what you did? It's a very slow recovery, right? This does not, you know, a really bad sprain or something. It's, it recovers very slowly. If you have a really significant strain on the tendon, you're basically going to break the collagen fibers. Now, once you break these collagen fibers, we can repair it, but it's like repairing a pair of jeans. It'll never be the same as it was. So once these things get stretched, they don't tend to go back as perfectly as they were. Okay, so once you weaken an area, it is forever weak. So this is what your tendons and ligaments are gonna look like under the microscope, densely packed collagen fibers made by fibroblasts. Okay. So again, you've got little tidbits, little facts to know for each of these. I think you'll find that each of these is very distinctive as well. Now, before I let you go on your six slides, let me also just mention this, this image here of skin. The next image, the next page you have in your PowerPoint should look like this skin model that we took this model and laid it on the copy machine. Right there we have this big spread image of the skin. Let me tell you what this is. We're going to spend about three minutes on the skin, and that's all we're going to do, and it's very, very easy today. This model, although it's not very obvious in your picture, is actually divided up into three parts. And again, I'll scribble on this. So there's actually three parts to this. And on this slide, you can sort of see there's a line here. So there's, this, there's a line here, and there's a line right here. Now, this third... This third over here, this represents the skin of your um, scalp, okay? That's the skin of your scalp. And if you look at it, you know, there's hair up here, right? No doubt we've got hair on our scalp. Okay, so we got hair up here. The middle portion, the, the middle third, is the skin of your armpit, the axillary region. And again, there's hair, but there's also a special kind of sweat gland down here that makes us stink more. Okay, so there's a different distribution of sweat glands. We'll deal with this when we get to the skin in lecture. But I just want you to see the, why there's a difference in the, in the model. And then the third portion, the third portion over here, this is the skin of your sole of your uh, foot or the palm of your hand. And one thing you'll notice is that there's no hair. Right? If you have hair in your palms, we should put you in the zoo right? or in the museum. Right? No hair. And you see a very, very thick layer of the outer epidermis. So this is a more protected portion of your body where the palms and soles are more protective. Again, we'll deal with the different business of the skin when we get to uh, lecture. For now, though, all you need to know for next week, if you look on that image on the left-hand side, you will see it marked as number one. Number one is pointing just to the thin purple outer layer. That is the epidermis. The epidermis is made of epithelial tissue, right? So the epidermis is epithelial. Then number two is pointing to this whole area, and that's called the dermis. And the dermis is largely connective tissue, right? So you've got epithelial sitting on top of connective tissue, just like we talked about before. The third layer of your skin really isn't actually of your skin. It's kind of a, a mistake, if you will, but what you see down here, all of this yellow represents fat. There's a lot of adipose, and that third layer, one, two, three, that third layer is called the hypodermis. It's also referred to as the subcutaneous layer. And that's all written there on your handout. So again, for next week, number three on the next week's quiz, it says label the epidermis the hypodermis, and the dermis. Just know those three layers, nothing else for next week. Okay, so turn over, if you would, in your Amerman book to the connective tissue area. This is going to be pages 
102 to 104. Let's cross off a few of these circles together that you don't need to worry about today. You can cross off number five, dense irregular. And your pre-lab told you to do this as well. You can cross off number six, the dense elastic. We won't be looking at that. You can cross off eight and nine. We're not looking at fibrocartilage or elastic cartilage. And that should now leave you with six circles. Those six circles represent the next six slides in your folder and represent the six connective tissues that we're looking at today. Now, this will go faster. This always goes much faster than the epithelial tissues. And over the next 15 minutes, I don't think you'll have any trouble at all identifying these. Again, as before, to ask yourself, what are you gonna do to remember it? And what are you gonna do uh, to remember where in the body it's found? Oops, I must've missed one. So cross off also, uh, number two, sorry. Number two gets crossed off, reticular. That should leave you six. Okay, when you are done, I'm just going to put this on the, on the recording right now. When you're done, make sure you put your microscopes away properly and think about all the proper ways of putting away your scope. And we'll take our post-lab assessment and we'll be done here at the end of our time.